Okay, so as you already know, Ryzen is officially a go. People are already pre-ordering the CPUs, they're getting them any day now. It's finally happening. It really is an exciting time to be part of the PC Master Race. Um, and if you'd like to know more about my thoughts on Ryzen and see some of my own benchmarking results, as I have managed to get my very own Ryzen CPU, then check out a video I'll be uploading after the March 2nd embargo has passed. Um, so I managed to get my hands on a Republica Gamers Crosshair 6 Hero X470 motherboard. Um, it was sent to me to make a full review on, but seeing as it's the board that I'm going to be doing all of my Ryzen testing on, so you would be seeing the same like benchmarks and graphs in the Ryzen video as in this video, I thought that I would just show them in that video instead, so you don't see them twice, and um, so that I can upload this video earlier. I hope that's okay. So if you can believe it, this will be the first time that I've ever really used an AMD board. Like, I did put together a little home fitter PC in a video once that used a mini ITX SOTAC board, but it was I had to dismantle the build like a week after the video and never really got to play with it. So this will be the first time that I'm actually like really getting to play with a AMD board. Um, and it's also my first board in the Crosshair series. And what a beautiful motherboard it is. I just want to say before we look at the board itself, the box it comes in is really nice, like it really feels like you've bought a premium item. And look at this sticker sheet you get with it. Like as someone who loves stickers, I needed a minute when I first found this tucked down the bottom of the box. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so, okay, so in the past we've seen AMD boards sort of lack behind their Intel counterparts in terms of features, and it, you know, it seems like every single time I look at a new Intel board there's always at least one person in the comments down below, you know, asking for exactly that board, but in an AMD variant. Um, so therefore, I am very pleased to say that the Crosshair 6 Hero really does live up to its said 270 counterpart, the Maximus 9 Hero. And I do have one here, so I can see, you know, you can better see both the similarities and variances and have kind of a hero v hero showdown. Um, but yeah, it's clear to see that Asus wanted both their AMD and Intel Hero boards to have similar designs, which really does make me hopeful that maybe we see like a Ryzen formula or like a Ryzen Extreme of a board at some point. I have to say that I do really prefer the visual changes made to the crosshair. Like, I really love the more solid look that the top heat sinks have. Even though it is a design style that we've seen on older boards, but, you know, despite that, and despite it therefore also not matching the chipset heatsink quite as well as it does on the Maximus 9 Hero, um, I think it was a good design for them to take a step back, because I really think that the, the, like, holy design is just kind of too much. Um, but putting aesthetics aside, I think the real reason for the heatsink change is to accommodate this heat pipe here that isn't on the Maximus, which makes me think that cross-head power delivery must require much more substantial cooling than the Maximus board, which I honestly actually hope that's the case, as, you know, I'd really love to be given a reason to walk on a motherboard again. Um, I know that's probably something weird to ask for. Um, so yeah, this motherboard features AMD's new AM4 socket, which supports all the new Ryzen CPUs. Now, technically, the socket does also support um, other upcoming CPU ranges, like the 7th generation APUs, but, you know, I, I really can't personally see someone wanting to spend more money on the motherboard than on the CPU, so with that being said, I think that the Crosshair's £250 price tag makes it clearly target for high-end Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 CPUs. I mean, actually, the Rurio doesn't even have any video outs telling me that, you know, while the AP APUs might be compatible, it wasn't, you know, made with them in mind, but yeah, so, <laughs> okay. So when it comes to cooling, Asus have actually added additional mounting holes for AM3 coolers, and, you know, this should allow you to continue to use your older AM3 coolers, water blocks, and LNG pots. Although, <laughs> they don't actually provide you with an AM3 backplate to be able to do this, so you have to kind of harvest one of an existing AMD board. Um, I did this and I test fit my NHD15 and it did leave a really nice spread with the thermal paste when I, you know, took it back off. So I, I do think it made good contact there, so that's good. Um, so in terms of the power delivery, the board uses a Digi Plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 phase design, uh, which basically there's eight phases dedicated to the CPU, four for the SOT, and two for the memory. Um, we have microphone allo chokes, next fit power block MOSFET, and 10K caps. 
But, you know, as I say in, like, every motherboard review that I do, the individual specs for the power components aren't anywhere near as important as how they've been implemented overall and how they work together. So, you know, if you're looking for a really great overclocking board, you really shouldn't just, like, compare how the boards will overclock based purely on power delivery specs. Like, you know, if you truly wanted to compare, you'd really need to watch two uh, different motherboard reviews made by the same reviewer, you know, both of which tested the same CPU to kind of have an idea of real world performance, um, and like a real world comparison. Um, but yeah, so, okay. So with the memory, we have four dual channel DDR4 memory slots. I know some people would have wanted to see quad channel set up with eight slots, but I do, I do really think this is a smart decision given the more kind of budget orientated, um, you, you know, AMD's more kind of budget oriented approach. Um, but yeah, so this board specs only go up to 3200 megahertz memory overclocks, which is low compared to Cabby Lake. Um, so my guess would be this is kind of a limitation in the memory controller on the Ryzen CPUs. So, you know, hopefully I'll be able to test with some high megahertz memory soon, and, you know, see for myself what's possible and how memory clock speed affects overall performance. Um, so moving on to the PCIe slots, we have two 3.0 slots, and with a Ryzen CPU you can run either a single GPU in x16 in the top slot, or two GPUs in ATX ATX, as this board supports two-way crossfire and SLI, and the board does come with a high bandwidth SLI bridge. Both of these PCIe slots are reinforced, which is an improvement over the Strix X99, which is the last motherboard I took a look at. Um, the X370 chipset also gives you four PCIe 2.0 slots, one being a full length one wired for X4, which shares its bandwidth with these three that are wired for X1. For storage, we have an M.2 socket, which runs at PCIe 3.0 X4, and this is provided by the CPU and supports both SATA and NVMe drives. There is also eight SATA 6GB per second ports, and these are provided by the X370 chipset. With the board, you do get four black SATA cables and some cable stickers. <laughs> now, I personally would really like to have seen a second M.2 socket, as firstly, I've been hoping to move to a completely cableless storage setup in all my systems except my server, and I'm more kind of likely to find myself with a single low capacity M.2 drive to begin with, and then eventually hopefully <laughs> get a second for additional capacity when I'm out of space. Um, but then also because the Z270 Hero has two M.2 sockets, and so do a lot of the other X370 Ryzen boards currently on the market. Although it is worth paying attention to what speed the additional socket run at on those X370 boards, as they're usually not for X4 PCIe 3.0 speeds. But, you know, still, I, you know, I would have personally preferred a second M.2 socket, even if it was slow in comparison, but, you know, then again, I suppose you could always just use, you know, a PCIe slot adapter if you really needed somewhere for a second drive to go. Um, but AMD have moved more of the IO to the CPU, which is, you know, really an SOC now, the end result being that Ryzen CPUs have more PCIe lanes on offer than KB Lake CPUs. Although the Z270 chipset does offer more expansion options than the X370 chipset, so there is that. Uh, but you know, overall, I do think that AMD's implementation offers enough lanes for the vast majority of use cases. Uh, so yeah, I thought I'd now take you on a quick tour around the board. Um, so along the top, we have your 8-pin power in and an additional 4-pin for extra stability for extreme overclocks. Then there's two CPU fan headers and a dedicated header for all-in-one coolers, which are set to provide all-in-one pumps full stable power by default. Below that, we have the first RGB header for controlling additional RGB lighting strips from, say, you know, BitPhoenix or CableMod um, through the Asus Aura software. Then we have the Q-code readout. Um, Along the edge, firstly, we have a 3D printing mount and the board includes one screw set. Now, whilst I love the idea of having a place to mount custom mods to the board, I really just don't like that Asus already had in mind for what you could mount here, but then, you know, didn't provide it in the box. It's like, this idea is cool, go manufacture it yourself. <laughs> but apart from that, I do, you know, love the idea behind this feature. Um, but anyway, we have the 24 pin connector and some multimeter readout points, which I just, I love to see on boards as you know, I find that programs like CPU-Z are not always the most accurate reading voltages. Like, you know, I definitely wouldn't use CPU-Z screenshots for comparing motherboard overclocking voltages anymore. Like, no. Um, 
But below that, we have an internal USB 3.1 header, which is provided by the X370 chipset. And I think that it's a much welcomed improvement over like the bulky standard USB 3.0 headers. Although, you know, of course, like case support is limited for this at the moment. Um, we have another 4-pin fan header and another 3D printing mounting point. Uh, here we have three headers that are going to be great for custom water cooling. These two are water cooling temp sensor headers, and then this one is a flow rate monitor header. So then along the bottom, we have your front panel connectors, um, a second RGB header, which is great to see as some cases do have RGB features built in. So not only, you know, could you power that, but you can also then have some separate internal case lighting too. Uh -huh. And the motherboard tiles come with an RGB strip extension cable. Above that, there's a temp sensor header. Um, this four pin fan header here is actually designed for water cooling pumps and provides three times as many amps as the other headers on the board. Um, you know, then we just have the standard USB 3.0 and USB 2.0 connectors provided by the chipset, uh, a connector here for ROG external controllers, and then a TPM header here. So to the left of that, there's both an LN2 mode jumper and a slow mode switch for sub zero overclocking. Then we move on to the onboard buttons. We have a really nice grey start button. You know, it's good to see it being a colour that will go with most colour themes. Um, Next to that, we have the conventional restart button, and then these two here that are going to come in very, very handy when overclocking. Um, okay, so this one here is a safe boot button, which will temporarily change the board settings so that you can safely make it into the BIOS if your overclock has stopped you from being able to get that far, while still retaining the last setting you used that didn't work. So, you know, you can tweak it without having to start from scratch, which is just great. And then this is a retry button here, which will just restart the system if you're struggling to boot into Windows. So, you know, if you have an overclock that's like right on the edge of being stable, causing you to have trouble booting, you can just keep jamming this button until you're in and then you just gotta have to hope that you can like get the screenshot in time. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's buttons like this that it just it really makes me want to have another go at really going for it with CPU's overclock. Like maybe maybe I'll be able to with this C Verizon CPU that I have after I finish getting all the benchmarks that I need for it. Uh, I hope so. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, and then along the bottom we also have another fan header and the front panel audio connector. Up this side, we have Asus's Supreme FX audio section, which features a new S1220 Kodak, and apparently that has a higher signal to noise ratio compared to the previous generations. Then up here, above the PCIe slots, we have one final fan header, giving the board a total of seven fan headers, although, you know, that amount, that amount will vary, you know, if you're using a water cooling pump or an all-in-one or just not. <laughs> and then lastly, we have the connector for the RGB lighting on the rear I.O. shroud. The rear I shroud, the bit of lighting up being the uh, crosshair six writing. And then on the chipset heatsink, um, as well as the ROG eye lighting up, also the lighting kind of fills the space under the heatsink, um, kind of giving it a floating effect, which does look really cool. I do think this board does do a really good job of how the RGB is implemented. Like, given the board itself has this really nice, like, stealthy, muted colour theme, it really does allow you to choose, like, the accenting colour for yourself. Um, and you can do this through the Aura software. Plus, you know, don't forget the two RGB headers for additional case lighting. Um, okay, so lastly, for a look around the board, we have the rear I.O. And there are an awful lot of USB ports here. We have eight USB 3.0 ports, four from the CPU and four from the chipset, then four USB 2.0 ports, all from the chipset, and then an Asmedia controller gives us both a Type A and a Type C USB 3.1 port too. Okay, so we also have a Colossimus button and a bias flashback button, and of course, audio outs here. With the networking, we have a gigabit LAN port using an Intel i2110 AT controller, which it's great, but I, you know, I do really wish that 10 gigabit networking would just kind of hurry up and <laughs> become mainstream already. <laughs> but yeah, um, and then for the Wi Fi, Asus have done something a little odd. <laughs> Basically, the board is marketed at being Wi Fi ready, supporting E key M.2 modules. Uh, there are even like pass through points on the Vario for the antenna cables, but thanks to the motherboard's shroud, it would be just ridiculously difficult to try to fit a third party module as you know the board would need to be in the case to lock the cables onto the rear shield but 
the motherboard shroud would prevent you from getting at the Rario whilst it's installed in the case. It just, it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fun to fit. Um, now, Asus do include a Wi-Fi Go module with some of their boards. Like, here's an old one I have from, like I said, 970 Deluxe. Um, it seems like just the whole setup going on on this board was actually designed for one of these Asus made enclosures in mind. But here's the thing, they don't actually make them like you currently can't pick these up separately um now my asus contact has told me that perhaps one day they'll be sold as an accessory which if they are then you know th this is great but you know but if they end up not being and so far the maximus 9 hero has gone without you know leading me to think that things aren't going to change anytime soon i do you think it's like you know a little naughty of asus to call this board wi-fi ready when it would be a total pain to actually make use of this so that was my look around the Republica Gamers Crosshair 6 Hero Motherboard. If you want to see the performance results, you'll have to check out my Rosen video. It's just a shame that I haven't had the chance to get it on test bench yet, so I can't give you any hint as to how it performs. But if um, what OCUK have been saying about it, then it does look like a very promising X370 board and one that I would definitely consider getting for myself. Um, but yeah, so if you like this video, please hit the like button. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the board and whether you're pre-ordering Ryzen. Um, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe, especially to you know catch my Ryzen video. And thank you for watching.